Okay, well, it's a, a real pleasure to be able to speak to you this evening about um, unconventional gas. And in particular, what I want to focus my presentation on is um, around groundwater. And I think that even though I've intended to make this um, broadly about unconventional gas, there is a slight and natural bias in my presentation towards uh, coal seam gas. It's an area that I've had more experience with um, over the last couple of years in my role with the statutory authority. Um, working with the federal government um, also as a member there, but also as the chair of the research committee for the federal government that's looking at um, research more generally um, in coal seam gas. Um, I get the advantage of being the third speaker and therefore being able to whiz through some of the introductory material that was really greatly covered by Martin uh, and Colin, and I'll do this really quickly. We've already heard about the different sorts of unconventional gas. Um, and how it's produced, both through heating and through microbial activity. Um, from the point of view of groundwater, one of the really important points is that that gas is held in the fractures and in the pore spaces of this rock material under water pressure. Um, and that's an important point that I'll come back to in a moment in terms of how we then go about removing both water and gas for uh, coal seam gas production. Uh, we've already talked about the differences between unconventional and conventional uh, gas sources and perhaps some of the unfortunate nature of the terminology and nomenclature there. I won't go through that again. Uh, and the different rock types. Um, I guess from the point of view of groundwater, these are going to vary in terms of their porosities. They're going to vary in terms of their permeability and ability to transmit water. Um, but we also know that, for example, um, in a shale gas that there's a more vari varied form of hydrocarbon types uh, and so on. So there are these variations in hydraulics as well as chemistry and, and gas types and so on. I think we've already seen this slide or a variation of it, coal um, basins in Australia as potential sources for coal seam gas. Um, there's obviously a fair preponderance there, isn't there, in the eastern states through Queensland, parts of New South Wales also Victoria, but also um, in South Australia, as you can see in the Paderka, Arkaringa and Cooper basins. Um, if we then look at the shale gas uh, picture, um, a little bit different, and again, we've already heard that this picture is not complete, but um, getting a complete um, synthesis of uh, resources is interesting in its own right, uh, but we can see here that the, we've already heard huge potential for shale gas uh, in Australia. In terms of the mechanisms and the, the hydraulics and the processes for releasing coal seam gas um, and extracting it and producing it, and these are fairly broad brush textbook figure type um, figures really, if you will. Uh, we're talking in the case of CSG production about drilling boreholes that on average are about 400 to 1,000 metres uh, deep. Um, the wells are pumped and we're trying to basically depressurize um, the coal bed in order to be able to remove both gas and water. So the depressurization process is absolutely critical here. Um, we're then separating and processing those at the surface. Um, and one of the important points about CSG, um, perhaps is distinct from shale gas production, and this is information from the Queensland government, is that about 8%, roughly speaking, of Queensland's 4,500 CSG wells have actually been hydrolog hydrologically or hydraulically fractured or fracked. So it's actually a minority, a vast minority of cases. Um, from the point of view of hydrology and water and salt, it's interesting, and we can't get exact single figures on this, but there are a range of sources that show um, that we're talking about a production um, of produced water in the CSG production process of anywhere between 120 to 300 gigalitres of water. Um, that's a very large amount of produced water. Um, and to calibrate that, just for um, information, Sydney Harbour volume is about 500 gigalitres. So it's a large volume of water produced per annum. And if you do some very rough and ready um, calculations to look at salt loads and production, if I assume that an average aquifer salinity of six grams per litre, brackish, not overly salty, seawater is about 35 grams per litre, so about um, what a fifth of seawater, roughly speaking, um, you can quickly see that one of the issues from a water perspective is not only just the water produced through 
co-produced water but also the salt loads and you quickly arrive at millions of tonnes of salt uh, that are produced um, on a regional scale. So one of the critical things that we're interested in looking at is um, the local water balances of the mining operation but also the regional water balances and the salt balances that come into these processes. Um, we've already heard of a number of these um, issues. I think water issues are obviously much um, smaller uh, with shale and tight gas than they are with perhaps CSG. Um, this range of issues here, um, I won't read through all of those, um, but I think it is really interesting and I think I concur with the previous speakers that if you start to write out a list of all the potential things, and I really emphasize potential, um, size 86 font, bold, underlined, potential, things that could go wrong, you end up with a list, pages and pages, reams of potential things that could go wrong. And the art form for us, um, being true to the science and the facts and the technical information, is not just to simply say all these things could happen, um, but it's, all, it's about being able to quantify the likelihood of those things happening and the risk. And that is really the challenge, in a nutshell, from where I sit in the science committee on these things is about, is about risk analysis, risk assessment. And of course, there are critical issues around effective monitoring, um, controls, regulation, and compliance issues as well. Um, I agree that many of the issues that we do know about, even in the coal seam gas um, sphere, tend to, on the most part, um, from international experience to date, um, be surface issues. Uh, rather than ground issue, groundwater issues, and that things like operator error, for example, I agree with the previous speakers, are what we are seeing from the data sets coming out from international reports are the most common things. But even those are sort of one in a thousand type um, occurrence incidents. So they're very small in their own right, and from all accounts, again, not my area of expertise, pretty rapidly and effectively mitigated. Um, and there are all sorts of other things that could potentially um, occur here that need to be mitigated. Um, from a groundwater perspective, I've already um, emphasized here, um, and I think a lot of the, um, the concern from a, um, a public policy, a political, a community um, angst um, can issues really do focus around the groundwater issues, um, certainly in what we're hearing daily um, in the media and so on. Um, Someone said to me um, that absence of evidence doesn't necessarily mean that that's evidence of absence. That is strictly true. Um, but we do know, based on experience in North America, for example, where there have been well over a million hydraulic fracturing jobs in the last 70 or so years, um, that the, the number of incidences of groundwater contamination are vanishingly small to non-existent. Um, it's a pretty large and compelling empirical data set. Now, there's a lot more work that I think we need to do in terms of putting the theory and the science behind that sort of empiricism, and that is what the research is that we're doing, um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. There's a lot of work going on in Australia right now about putting regulation around coal seam gas, the regulatory frameworks, and trying to make sure that we're working towards a unified um, set of national and harmonised regulations. Um, and some of these reports are available on the website and are quite recent. Um, so this example here, the National Harmonised Regulatory Framework. Um, and they, for many parts, uh, for the most part, do in fact deal with water management and co-produced water, so the large volumes of, of water that are produced. And I've said already, more for CSG, certainly by a long shot, than that for shale gas. Now, what we can do with that co-produced water will depend on a whole raft of things that I won't go into here, but there are many strategies that are often employed or can potentially be employed from disposal of that co-produced water in evaporation ponds where it evaporates um, through to, for example, the um, reuse or beneficial use of water for irrigation, um, potentially also through to re-injecting that co-produced water into underground uh, aquifer systems. So from a groundwater perspective, the sorts of things that we need to be thinking about, um, and again, potential impacts, 
um, and water issues are depressurizing the coal beds. What is the way, how does that affect the pressure in overlying and underlying aquifer systems as we draw those down? Uh, what is the connectivity between the coal beds and those overlying aquifers um, that perhaps we're using for regional groundwater abstraction? Uh, what is the connection of these systems to surface water systems? Uh, how could contamination potentially move through that geologic system? Um, it, what is the risk of subsidence um, and movement and remobilization of salt? Um, and I'm emphasizing here again about likelihood, consequence, and risk. It is not helpful, and I've had to go through a journey really to understand the going from writing all these things down to quantifying risk is the critical bit because it does potentially look a little bit like the Armageddon scenario if you just simply write down that all these things could happen. I want to just spend just a few minutes, and I'll be very brief because I want to leave time for questions, um, just talking about the sorts of research, um, knowledge gaps and critical areas that we see emerging, um, particularly in coal seam gas production, um, a bit of the work that we're doing in Canberra in the statutory authority looking at research um, internationally and where we can start to really take um, some advances in Australia in the investments that we make um, moving forward. Um, and just, this is not exhaustive, it's just some of the work that we're doing and looking at right now. Um, some of the work around computer modelling and the need for us to develop robust simulators and predictive tools for CSG production. And one of the particular areas that's of interest is that we do know um, that there's a fair, um, not always, but in many cases, disagreement between the models that are used for, um, for energy production, uh, the dual phase models that simulate both water and gas, compared to the classical models that I would use um, in groundwater hydrology, such as MOTFLO, that only simulate water. And so getting to the bottom of these discrepancies is a current um, and pressing issue that we're currently working on. Um, obviously, dealing with geological heterogeneity is a key issue um, that we're looking at setting up major projects in. Um, and there's a number of dimensions to this particular issue. Um, how, uh, what is the integrity of um, aquitars, the low permeability clay layers in these systems? How permeable are they? Um, what is the role of faulting and fracturing in these systems? Um, can we quantify, in the presence of faulting and fracturing, um, the potential rates of movement of water as well as solutes and chemicals in those systems to really get our heads around potential transit times and length scales? Um, Upscaling is an interesting issue. One of the key parameters that we need in our groundwater models is a parameter um, called hydraulic conductivity. Um, it's a parameter that essentially is representative of um, whether we're dealing with the sand, which has a high hydraulic conductivity, or a clay, which has a low hydraulic conductivity. Um, what we're often doing is using equipment like the centrifuge here. This is Wendy Timms and some of the researchers at the National Groundwater Centre uh, measuring um, some of the permeabilities of aquitard materials, um, in many cases from coal seam gas um, production facilities. Um, and these are measured on really small scales, so um, several um, uh, cubic centimetres, for example, but they're very small samples. Now, we get permeability estimates from a centrifuge, um, and that's got the advantage that we can spin these around really, really fast and make water flow through them at much faster than they would normally in the aquifers and aquitards, so we can get um, rapid permeability assessments. But how representative are those values that we get from the centrifuge when it comes to the parameters that I need to put into a regional scale model that's not now operating on the scale of centimetres, but is on the scale of, say, tens to hundreds of kilometres. And so that upscaling issue is a really critical one um, and reconciling the values we get from different methodologies at different scales uh, remains a very pertinent research question. Yep, I'm nearly done. Uh, water quality um, is obviously critical, I will say no more. Um, this is not only about the hydraulics and the flows and the quantities, it's absolutely about both quantity uh, and quality um, and looking at a range of methods for dealing with those. 
Um, we're also interested in assessing connectivity between uh, deep groundwater, shallow groundwater, and from those shallow groundwater systems um, to uh, the surface water systems that are connected with them. So understanding how surface water and groundwater interact, um, what role depressurization has, if any, on changing flows and fluxes to streams. Um, in some cases, we're also releasing co-produced water into streams that has the potential to move from the stream into the groundwater system if that stream is losing water from the river to the groundwater. So understanding these interactions is critical. Uh, critical from a hydraulics point of view, critical from a chemicals point of view, but also we're interested in ecological response and impact um, in this sort of work as well. Um, another area that we're um, seeing a lot of interest in is the way in which these water systems interact with vegetation and groundwater dependent ecosystems. If water tables shift or drop, um, what is the impact of the declining water table on vegetation health and community health, speciation and so on. Um, and so there's some interesting thinking that's going into this sort of work. We've already talked about risk. I think that is a critical issue. And getting our heads around robust risk assessment, risk analysis, risk mitigation strategies as part of environmental impact statements and assessments. The other area that I think we're really grappling with, and I'm still yet to see an, a really good example, probably the Surat Basin Groundwater Impact Assessment is probably the best one that we can find in Australia. It's an excellent example of looking at cumulative impacts. So not just one borehole now, or one CSG production facility, but what happens is that scales up to tens, to hundreds, to thousands of production bores. How do those interact? And what is the cumulative superposed effect of those on groundwater systems? And that's an area um, certainly that the committee that I'm on is really grappling with in terms of how we advance um, our understanding of cumulative rather than single um, mining site impacts. Um, all the work that I've talked about has been obviously focused on the biophysical, the technical, perhaps the scientific. I think that there is a huge amount of work still to be done in understanding um, the nature of regulation, compliance, uh, community attitudes um, and acceptance um, of CSG and unconventional gas production technologies. Um, there's a range of very interesting similarities between how we um, deal with these things in Australia versus, for example, in the US around minerals um, ownership um, and so on. So some really interesting um, research to do there. I think that um, this is an absolutely critical part of understanding um, the total uh, picture as far as unconventional gas production is concerned and that we've still got some work to do there. Um, the IASC is the committee that Paul mentioned um, that, I, that I'm a member of. It's worth, if you haven't had a look um, at our website, to do, do so if you get a moment. Um, so the committee is doing work on research um, and defining a research portfolio for coal seam gas and large coal mining development, um, working on the development of um, very large bioregional assessments across Australia to look at the impacts of coal seam gas and coal mining uh, on groundwater, hydrology, surface hydrology and ecology. Um, and also one of our key functions is also to, for the Commonwealth Government to assess um, the environmental impact statements and referrals from both Commonwealth Government and State Government for um, coal mining and coal seam gas um, proposals. So um, look, in summary, I think that there are a number of issues. I won't read through all of these. From a groundwater perspective, it's about understanding the water balances in these systems as well as the salt balances. Uh, being able to look at local impacts as well as regional impacts, and that means um, looking at potential impacts and then quantifying the probabilities, the likelihoods, the consequences, and therefore risks. That's a critical point. Um, I think we've got a lot of work to do in cumulative impact, and I've already outlined just a few examples of some of the research areas that the um, Commonwealth Government, for example, are looking at progressing. So I'll leave it there. I think I had an acknowledgement slides, but you can read that. So thanks, Paul. <laughs>